Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night's um, verse by verse, chapter by chapter Bible study here at Calvary International Baptist Church. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Again, want to thank you for every single day, and we just want to thank you for tonight. That on a Wednesday night we can study your word, and you know, two more weeks to go before we finish up um, Job, and it's um, it's been good. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for the lessons that we learn from you that's timeless. Will you be with us right now? Be with ev everyone who's listening, watching on YouTube, Lord. You know their hearts. May you just touch them, comfort each one, encourage each one. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Job chapter 38. And as you know, you know, we have the perspective from heaven, God's word. And a lot of times in life, we, um, you know, we think we know, we have our assumptions. We think we know, you know, what's going on and we know what to do and all that. And we know how to counsel people. But the truth is, you and I do not have um, full data. Uh, God sees everything from beginning to end. He has all the data. We only have part of the data, and you know, Job's friends uh, try to comfort Job because he he lost his children, um, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, and they all thought that you know, Job, it's because of what you've done. It's because you probably have some hidden sin that's, that you're really good at covering up. We couldn't really, we can't find it. And, but God sees it, and, 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 and because of what you have done, you're getting punished for it. It's a philosophy. In fact, it's a philosophy that we, you know, in this world today, we even have. You know, we think of people who are suffering, who are homeless. They, they must have done something. Uh, wrong, or if someone has cancer, or, you know, they must have, but the truth is, you know, we don't know why. Of course, there are things in life that there are consequences uh, for doing. I mean, I, I was an ex-cop, and, you know, when someone robs somebody or assaults someone, and you get caught, you're going to jail. Um, there's going to be uh, consequences. There's going to be jail time. There's going to be um, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, for the family, it'll be embarrassment. If you commit adultery and there's, you know, maybe, you know, someone gets pregnant. I mean, there's consequences to action. Sure, that makes sense. But there are, other, like Job, and there are many, many people throughout this world, through no fault of their own, Something happens. Life happens. And for Christians, and actually especially for Christians, when someone accepts the Lord in a closed country where you can't really speak the name of Jesus, you can't um, say openly that you are a Christian. Um, and just because a person becomes a Christian, then there are consequences. And back in Jesus' time, um, right after uh, he died on the cross, ascended to heaven. I mean, Christians were persecuted just for being Christians. Um, eaten by lions, getting beaten, imprisoned, killed. Uh, and, and people say, see, see, you know, they must have done something wrong. Not true. Um, so we don't have all, we have to be very careful in our assumptions, in our life assumptions that, we have all the answers. God has all the answers. We just have to make sure that we're doing what the Lord wants us to do. Uh, we don't want to do anything that the Lord does not want us to. We don't even want to guess. We want to make sure that it's in His Word and that the Holy Spirit's leading us. Um, his friends thought they knew. They assumed that they're speaking for God. And they weren't. And God's going to speak right now. And Remember, the first three friends, they thought that you must have some hidden sin, so you're getting punished for that. 
And Job kept saying that, no, no, no. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I just, I wish I could talk to the Lord and, and explain and, 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 and talk to him and, and, and make my case. I, I don't know why. And then, you know, they, the three friends and Job, they came to a, um, a stalemate where, you know, nobody's really budging. And then the a fourth friend, a younger guy, Elihu, um, decided that he wants to, he's been listening to them and, and he wants to put his two cents worth. And he, did, he basically came from a, uh, he was mad at the three friends for stopping from, from, for, for stopping from accusing Job and just making sure that Job would just be beaten down. But so he said that, hey, I want to say something. And what he said was, um, he said it was more of a corrective. Um, God was using these actions for correction, meaning that, um, that Job was on his way to doing something bad, and God uses his corrective measures to bring a person back. And I have some, um, I put some eye drops in my eyes. But anyway, so he came from that point of view, but he still believes that Job did something wrong and God was correcting him. So at the end of what Elihu was saying, there in the, um, the end of chapter 37, we noticed that there's, the weather was changing. There was a whirlwind. There might have, might have been a tornado coming. And he was talking about lightning, just a weather changing. And now God speaks after 37 chapters. Um, Job wanting, wanting to have God speak. And, and all these people assume they're speaking for God. But it's best to wait for the Lord to speak. So 30, uh, chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Wow. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Uh, what are you guys talking about? I mean, a lot of people talk without really knowing anything. People counsel without knowledge. And he says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And so God's saying that, you know, are you sure you know what you're talking about? Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Sometimes we have people telling us what to do, but they really don't know what to do. They don't have all the data. They don't, um, it's words without knowledge. And then, now God's telling Job and everybody else there, those four guys there, that let me ask you some questions. And it's really cool what questions God asks. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To where, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He's saying that, where were you when, I, when this whole earth, when the universe, when creation was created. Where were you? Wow. Where were you when I laid the foundation? You know, a lot of people, I mean, even in today's world, um, you know, you think about um, the, the theories about the creation of the universe, the theory about um, theory of evolution, theory about how man was came by, how this whole world came by, by the Big Bang Theory. But those are all theories, right? There is not, and uh, you know, some of you will disagree with me, and, and I, I get it. 
I mean, I have a lot of uh, friends who are in science and and they, you know, they, they have certain beliefs. But, you know, it is still called the theory of evolution. It's still the Big Bang Theory. Nobody was there except if you are a Christian, God was there, the only one. And he's saying, who, where were you? Nobody was there, only God. And this theory of evolution, theory of the origin of the universe, you know, you know, as far as you and I know, when something bangs up, when something explodes, there's no design in that. There's nothing, there's no design. And um, theory of evolution, uh, I know a lot of you believe in science and all that, but science means that it has to be repetitive, there, there's experiments, and the results could be repeated all the time. That's science. And there's evolution from, from a, a, a um, non mass from a uh, from something that's that keeps evolving into a design and I talked about this before if I were to tell uh, kids today and I did you, you know little kids you know Sunday school kids that if I tell them that my my phone my iPhone was um, you know this just came about just by by some sort of an explosion some sort of a um, that the winds just blew it in and and all the intricacies of 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 the inside the the circuits the the components um the semi you know the the, the storage unit uh the screen uh the cover all the apps just came together and voila a iphone i mean no kid would believe that no one would believe um, and even the the color uh, all the of all the um, the screenshots and by the way all the pictures came together because all of a sudden you know something just downloaded and all that stuff it just came together by itself no one would believe it but we we go by this theory of evolution it's not science of evolution and not science of human origin. God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Back then, in ancient times, they think the earth was on a turtle. And in Greek time, in, um, uh, you know, in two, three thousand years ago, they believe Hercules was the one who, um, who was holding up the earth. Uh, Atlas was holding up the earth. Uh, you know, and, and they're teaching all this stuff. Uh, even in the 50s, the Piltan man, they, they, they believe that there was a, there was a ga uh, gap, and uh, it was a missing gap uh, in the evolution and turned out to be, I believe, is a, uh, a, a swine's a pig's tooth. Uh, they're teaching all this stuff in schools. But God asked Job, where were you? when I laid the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. And he said, how about the measurements? Surely you know. Uh, when, uh, you know, the, he stretched out the line um, of, of, of the earth and uh, of measuring the earth. You know, Job couldn't answer these questions. Um, uh, in an earlier verse, uh, the the earth, it says the earth was hanging on nothing. I mean, who knew that? I and mean, people thought earth was flat. People thought, uh, didn't know it was a sphere. And it has, it, you know, the sphere was, was held on nothing. And, and I mentioned that, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, it's, it's amazing that the Lord would use this to ask Job to start with um, questions that he couldn't answer. And the truth is, we couldn't answer. We weren't there. But God was there. And if you believe in God, you know he's the only one 
uh, eternity past, eternity future, he sees it, the only one. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And then, you know, I want to point out verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Sons of God are the angels. And when, so this is, tells us that the angels were created prior to creating the earth because the, they were shouting for joy when everything was put together, when the earth was formed. Uh, verse 8, um, or who shouted in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit on it and set bars and doors, when I said, this, is, this far you may come, but no farther, but here your proud ways must stop. You know, who set the boundaries of where the sea would stop at certain boundaries? Um, the earth is around, what, two-thirds covered in water, one-thirds land. And without the mountains and, you know, and basically the canyons and without these boundaries, if all the water, um, some scientists figured, all the water in the ocean if everything was flat, it will cover the, um, uh, the whole earth. It will cover the whole earth. Um, I think it's 6,000 feet. But God placed the boundaries for the oceans. And, um, yeah, and he said, hey, who did that? Uh, rhetorical question. Verse 12, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? that he might take hold of the end of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and the upraised arm is broken. You know, it's one of those things is the Lord is kept, he, he wanted to know, you know, these are, natural events that you could observe but you don't know the answers to. These are all physical events that you see but you don't have, you weren't there. So how could you even ask? How could you even, you know, you know ask, pretend to know or think that you know, presume to know anything about the spiritual laws or the moral laws of God. If these physical laws, these physical, um, you know, signs, these physical events that you see, water, ocean stopped at certain points, the beginning of the universe, man, um, would, uh, just all these things that you, ha you couldn't answer, how could you even presume that you know the moral laws or the spiritual laws of God? Verse 16, have you entered the springs of the sea have you, or have you walked in search of the death, of the depth? Have, you, have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? You know, um, Job, uh, he, he, when he was suffering, and he's still suffering right now, but it's going to, um, we're going to have a happy ending um, next week when we finish up Job. But he's still suffering, but in the midst of it, at the beginning of it, in the middle of it, he wanted to die. He wanted to just, just go and, and he just figured that, hey, if I die, I'm not going to feel anything anymore. And, um, and I, I just don't understand why this is happening. I just want to die. That's what's Job's. And he couldn't find God and he wanted to talk to the Lord. And he kept saying he, you know, he wanted to, but he wanted to die. But God's asking him now, 
Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Do you know anything about death? And Jesus actually said that um, do not, the, the word of the God said that do not fear the people um, who could put the body to death, who could kill the body, but fear the one who can send the soul after physical death to hell. Fear God. And a lot of people would, um, you know, I believe it's the, um, there's certain different religions, um, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, the, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, the, um, um, the uh, yeah, there's different ones who uh, would use Job as um, when he was suffering to say that, hey, you know, when you die, you just go to sleep and, and it's um, something called soul sleep and all that. Uh, but Job was, Job was just in his suffering, he's thinking that. He has no understanding of death. And God here is saying that, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of shadows of death? God refuted that. And Jesus is the one we should turn to. Because Jesus, um, he said in, um, I believe it's Luke, uh, middle of Luke 15, 16 right there, that he, um, he told a story, a parable, about the rich man and Lazarus, who um, uh, rich man had everything, Lazarus had sores over his body trying to get the crumbs from the rich man, and the uh, rich man and, and Lazarus, the poor guy, both died. Lazarus ended up in, um, with, in Abraham's bosom, uh, a place of awaiting and just kind of um, enjoying life, and then the, the, the rich guy, ended up in a place called Sheol and suffering and, and wanted, and he, there's no soul sleep. He was just, he was so thirsty that he could see Lazarus and Abraham and said, hey, Father Abraham, call Lazarus, tell him to go get some water to put it in my tongue. And uh, Abraham told him that, hey, there's the big gulf, big gap between us. No one can cross, right? So there's no um, where there there's no just because one person dies that's not the end and uh, there's no soul sleep a person when a person leaves this earth the Bible says in Hebrews nine twenty nine um, it is point, pointed for man to die once after that comes judgment and you and I, Christian, non-Christian, we're going to be facing the Lord Jesus. For Christians, when we face the Lord Jesus, there's no judgment of, uh, of being in heaven or being in hell because we received Him as Lord and Savior while we're here on earth. He died on the cross for us, paid for our sin. We accepted that gift. We asked Him to come into our heart to transform us so we can have a relationship with Him and knowing that He paid for it all, my sins that I couldn't pay for myself, and I will be with Him because of His grace through faith. But for people who reject Jesus, says no to Jesus, then you'll face judgment, and that judgment will be, uh, we call it the great white throne judgment, and that is to show that you did not receive the gift of Jesus when he died on the cross, and you're going to pay for it on your own, and that's hell. And so that's, um, so God was asking Job, have the gates of hell, uh, death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? And then verse 18, have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. You know, it's nobody knows. I mean, at this time, how could they know? Um, they, they don't know how big the earth is. They don't know who formed it. 
Um, yeah. Verse 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? You know, it's an interesting question that God's asking here. Where does light go? Where does darkness go when you turn on the light? And where does light go when you turn off the light? God's asking him the question. That you, verse 20, that you may take it to his territory, that you may know the path of his home. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of days is great? Um, verse 22, have you entered the treasury of snow? Have you seen the treasury of hail? We're not really sure what this treasury of snow is, but we do know that every snowflake is unique and is a perfect, in perfect geometrical shape that's beautiful and is unique, every single one. And he says, have you entered the treasury of snow? God made that beautiful. Each snowflake, God made each person beautiful in his sight, maybe not in our sight. But the Word of God says each person is fearfully and wonderfully created. And yes, I, I understand about people who are born different and all that. Uh, but in God's sight, He has a purpose for each one. But what is this? Or have you seen the treasury of hail, ice, treasury of ice? You know, it's, um, if you read the next verse, and it continues because there's a comma there. Have you seen the treasure of hail, ice, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of the battle and war? Wow. What does that mean? And people have been wondering about this. And there's a, there is a, a theory, and we'll find out for sure when we go to heaven. But, you know, Back in the World War I, um, the British had a, a really hard time in um, um, transporting um, uh, TNT uh, with nitroglycerin because it's very, very um, unstable. Movement, bang. And then they lost a big ship um, trying to transport, uh, transport um, very unstable um, you know, explosives. And finally, this Jewish guy, uh, Weissman, um, he found a way, and his, the team found a way to reduce the temperature, stored in a reduced temperature, an icy temperature, and then this ex these explosives, uh, unstable explosives, became stable. And then they, they, can, they can move. And so, because of that, and this the guy Weissman was a Jewish guy, uh, Russian-born Jewish guy, and because of that, they have the Bill for um, Declaration, where the Brits um, declared that um, there's going to be a uh, in the land of Palestine uh, where Jewish people could go back because of the de declaration in 1917, and then that led to the nation of Israel in the late 40s. And so because of freezing, lowering the temperature in what? Um, battle and war, for days of battle and war, uh, in times of trouble. And this is, I mean, I, you know, I look at this and it makes sense to me and it's just, um, but We'll find out in, in heaven. But this guy, Wiseman, and he became the first president of, of Israel and because of his team found a way of lowering um, uh, uh, is a treasury of hell, a uh, treasury of ice. Um, verse 24, by what way is light diffused? or the east wind scattered over the earth. Um, I mean, the science of light diffusion, uh, I mean, this is Job's time. This is 
uh, we're talking about close to the time of Abraham, and it's um, and they're talking about this. I mean, there's no way Job would know any of this these answers. And then um, verse 25, or who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the a thunderbolt to cause it to rain on land where there is no one, a wilderness uh, in which there is no man. You know, when water comes down from heaven, um, who made those canyons? Who made those channels where it can just go to these different places? And who's going to water the wildflowers in the wilderness? Who's going to water the forest when there's, uh, I mean, there's no irrigation system? But God created a natural one. Verse 27, to satisfy the desolate waste and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? For, from, from whose womb comes the ice? And, fr and the frost of heaven who gives its birth? And the water is hardened like stone, and the surface like the deep is frozen. Can you bind... Uh, bind the cluster of the Pleiades. Uh, Pleiades uh, is the a winter constellation. It's called also the seven stars, um, seven sisters. It's a cluster of seven sisters, and it's um, often mistaken for the Little Dipper. Little Dipper is different. Um, that's north, and it's um, it including the North Star. But uh, I mean, back then. They have this. They have this information. Or loose the belt of Orion, another winter constellation. And if you look at the zodiac, it's just um, uh, the Orion's chasing Taurus and all that stuff. But they had all this information um, back then. Uh, let me turn the page. Can you bring out uh, Mazurath? In its season, um, that's you know basically just looking at the stars. Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Great bear here is Arturus. Arturus um, in, in the ancient language, but it's um it's a the fourth brightest star. And the fourth brightest star, they realize that uh, now it's um it's one of the closest stars compared to the other stars, um, around 36 light years. Away, which is con considered uh, close, but Arturus is eighty times brighter than our sun. is thirty times bigger than our sun. Our sun can contain one point two million Earth, right? And so it's really, really big. This is thirty times bigger and eighty times brighter, but. Our tourist or the great bear here, it moves at 70 miles per second. Chidi uh, 4,200 miles uh, per hour, 4,200 miles per hour. And God was asking Job and for the, all the, for the four other four friends there, can you guide this great bear with its cubs? Can you guide them? Can you drive it? 4,200 miles per hour. It's 70 miles per second. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and how do we know all this? You know, if you look at ancient um, astronomical um, these uh, charts, it shows Arturus, and then you look at today, you can calculate that it's, it's moving. It's moving. At a at a rapid pace, and it's um, seventy miles per second, and you know the knowledge that they had back then. But you know God, He was there. He knows. We we weren't there, and all these professors they weren't there, but God was there, and and, and God is here. And I guess, you know, if we want to talk theologically, it's um, God is, basically, for him, it's all present, right? Okay, um, verse 33. 
Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you set the dominions over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightning that they may go and say, here we are, and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? God is saying that, you know, uh, who created man? Who, who gave man the capacity to think and then to store information? And, um, and then he's asking about who can number the clouds by wisdom. Uh, and so Job's listening to all this. All his friends are listening to all this. Verse 38, um, when the dust hardens in clumps and when the clouds cling together. Verse 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion? or satisfy the appetite of the young lions, or when they crouch in their dens or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait, who provide food for the ravens when its young one cry to God and wander about for lack of food. You know, God was kind of reminding me, if you get close to nature, you're going to see that God's taking care of everything. God oversees everything. God sees everything. God sees us. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that, um, that, you know, he said, don't you see the sparrows? God takes care of them. Not one of them fall. God closes them. God feeds them. How much more are you worth more than sparrows? And God sees you. God sees me. And, and God, if he takes care of the sparrows, he's going to take care of you and me. Uh, chapter 39, do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? And then, you know, God's now turning to different animals here. What can you mark when a deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. You know, um, it's amazing that how God created animals, and and you know they, you know, a lot of them are in the wild. They don't have vets, but God created the babies strong. Some some of these animals don't even get to see their parents. Um, and then, but it's a, it's kind of interesting that how God created man, but we're very dependent on our parents. Um, in the beginning, and actually it's for many years, and right now it looks like some people are dependent on parents for 20, 30, 40 years. So, just a joke. Uh, usually you should get out of the house by 18, right? Just saying. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. And then verse um, 5. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds? Uh, of the onager, wh whose home I have made in the wilderness and the barren land, his dwelling. His, he scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountain is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. And then he keeps going. Well, the wild ox, um, God just um, talked about the different animal life, and then wild ox, be willing to serve you. Will he bed by your manger, can you bind the wild ox uh, in a furrow with ropes? Or will he plow the valley behind you? This wild ox actually is a real animal. It's an extinct animal. The King James calls it a unicorn. But um, this wild ox, actually Caesar wrote about this wild ox. It's, a, it's the size of an elephant, just smaller than an elephant with a huge horn. And no one could tame it. They tr and Caesar and his guys tried to capture one, but unsuccessful. No one could tame it, and it became extinct. Um, but it's called, it was an, a wild ox, and King James calls it a unicorn. Verse 11, um, will you trust him because his strength is great? Will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your thresh threshing floor? And then verse 13, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly. But are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground, 
and worms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. So ostriches are very interesting. They would lay their eggs in the ground a foot deep, close it up, and just forget about them. And um, the, the Middle East has a proverb saying that um, as stupid as an ostrich, what happens is, you know, they just leave the eggs laying there and then anybody can step on it and, and crush the eggs, but it's around a foot deep. Um, ostriches also um, tend to, you know, when they, they want to hide, they put their head in the sand or in a bush thinking that no one would see them. So that's why um, hiding your head in the sand um, became a proverb and, um, and as stupid as an ostrich in the Middle East um, became a saying there uh, because they're not very bright. But, but um, verse 17, oh, and this is why, because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. So we know that that's why there's that proverb. But verse 18, when she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. Back then, they know this already. So when the officer finally figures out that just by hiding his or her head inside a bush or sand, people, you know, animals, um, predators, they'll see them. They, they, their head are raised up, lifts herself on high, and she runs, and he runs, and they're faster than horses. Amazing. God created amazing animals. Um, verse 19, have you given the horse strength? Have you clo uh, clothed his neck with sun thunder? This is talking about war horses. Can you frighten them like a locust? His majestic snorting strike terror, his paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear and is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because a trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, he says, Aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shoutings. And then he goes on verse 26, Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wing toward the south? This is interesting. Um, God planted, God gave um, in the minds of these birds, you know, a sense to migrate to the south instinctively during winter time. And and how this happens, you know, these these bird scientists they're amazed at and how these birds would know when to fly south and when to fly north and uh, their migration patterns, right? And the ones that I, I talked about here at Calvary, this must have been two, three, uh, many years ago. Um, and this is a story that my, uh, my pastor loves to talk about. He would go see these um, golden uh, plovers um, in, in Hawaii. And these are amazing um, birds. They would mate and, um, and raise their young ones in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And so um, by, you know, summertime, you know, they, 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 they would fly um, to the Aleutian Islands. And guess what? It's around 2,500 to almost 3,000 miles over ocean. So they, before they fly late spring, summertime, early summer, they would, they would um, fatten up. They would eat more and have layers of fat and then, you know, get, gain, you know, just have sustenance. And they start flying. It takes about 50 hours over 2,500, three, close to 3,000 miles, nonstop, no GPS. And it's over ocean. There's no markers or anything like that. 
they go to the Aleutian Islands, they would mate there, raise their kids, um, hatch, uh, incubate, um, and, and, and just, you know, and, but interesting enough is that by, um, before winter, by the fall, they would fatten up again and have layers of fat, and then they start flying back. And these birds are smart. They like to vacation in the winter in Hawaii. Um, uh, snowbird, no, I'm just joking. Uh, but they actually fly back to Hawaii. And I mean, again, no GPS. I mean, think about it. Today, I mean, without GPS, I, I wouldn't know how to get to Taipei, Taipei you know, uh, these different streets to these restaurants or you know, visiting people, uh, these alleyways. You need GPS just to tell you how to go 15 minutes or 30 minutes. But these birds are flying with no, with, uh, we, nobody knows how they know. Um, we know it's from God. Maybe they're using the stars. We don't know. There's, there, there's no markers. And even if it's flying um, with, uh, when there's wind and storms and they're off, they're, they're blown somewhere else, they still make it to Hawaii. There's something innate that's built in. And how do they do that? And you could say, oh, they've been there. But here's the interesting thing. The parents leave first. But then these little kids, these little birdies, they weren't strong enough when the, bir when the parents leave. What happens is they get stronger two weeks later. They eat more, and two weeks later, Without any, without any GPS, without anybody teaching them, they fly from the Aleutian Island, Alaska. And if you go to Nome today, you'll see the golden glovers in this season. And you go to Hawaii, you'll see them. These little birds, the baby birds who waited two weeks later, around two weeks later, they would fly a route that they never flew before around 50 hours, 2,500 to 3,000 miles away, and land in Hawaii. Amazing. I mean, God, where there's design, you know, there's a designer. Nobody makes, uh, iPhones don't just come together. This building just doesn't come together. Humans don't just boom come together, this whole earth, this whole universe, how the anthropic principle of the earth, how earth was just just in its right place, in its right place in the solar system, one degree off, one degree this way, that way, everything changes, frozen or burned. Um, there's a design in this universe. Where there is design, there has to be a designer and these golden glovers are, are, are just um, amazing. You can Google it. Okay. Um, does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On a rock it dwells um, and resides. On the crag of the rocks in the stronghold, from there it spies on their prey, its eyes observe from afar. Its young ones suck up blood where the slains are. There it is. You know, uh, God made, gave these eagles and, and hawks and, I mean, amazing eyesight where they can see uh, far, far away from the air and, and then just pluck up, um, you know, animals for dinner. Uh, so it, God was letting Job and the friends know, where were you guys? when all this, these things are happening. And, and, and for them to understand that there are things that we, we don't understand, and only God understands. And so it was an eye-opening experience, and uh, the next three chapters, we're going to finish up next week. You know, Job's going to just say that, you know, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. 
I, I, I don't understand. Lord, you're God. I'm not God. We're going to finish up Job next week, and it's, um, it's a happy ending. And we need a happy ending uh, in life. And for you and me, God put an imprint um, in Romans 1. Um, and let me turn there. I wasn't planning to do this, but God put an imprint in each person. It's almost like, like we need, we're missing something until we know our Lord. And only He can fill that void. And, you know, just like He imprints animals and birds. Um, let me find out where this is. Uh, it says, I think it's 119. Uh, what is it? He says, because of what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. And then verse 24, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal powers and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thought. But the key here I want to show you is that God made it evident because God created each one in verse 19, for God has shown it to them. And then that which may be known of God is manifested in them. God made each one that everyone is hungering for God, for Jesus, for the God who created the heavens and the earth. Only Jesus can satisfy this longing. Only He, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Only Jesus, who was God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, was there in the beginning. Yes, he came as a baby boy 2,000 years ago, but prior to that, he was God, the second person, in the beginning. He was there when everything was created. He saw everything. And now God came to earth 2,000 years ago, became one of us, understanding everything about you and me, what we have to go through, and even more. And yet, he's willingly, God willingly, died on the cross to pay for the sins that we could not pay. He paid for sins he didn't commit, we did, because he loved us. He loves us even now. And so for you and me, let's turn back to him. Let's turn back to the God who loves us and accept him, saying, Lord, I accept your gift. You, you paid for everything. I accept that gift. I want you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I want to walk with you, to abide in you, to just live life for you and live life as you guide me. You know, you'll never regret it if you do this. You'll never, never regret it. And, and he imprinted that. And every time we try to go do something else, do this, do that, trying to, 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 to kind of cover it up or to replace it with something, it doesn't work. It's all temporary. The only thing that's permanent is walking with Jesus every day. He'll give you that joy. He'll give you that peace that we're all longing for. And he'll give you that purpose for your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being our God. And thank you for showing us you know, you were there at the beginning. You know the whole story. You know our beginning and our end. And we were not there. But Lord, we want to be with you. And Heavenly Father, will you give us that peace that only you can give as we walk with you. And I pray this for every single person who is watching this right now. Give them that peace. And I pray that they will accept you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you here next week. We'll finish up Job next week. God bless.